Good day and welcome everybody. My name is Gary Jesh and I'm your moderator for today's webinar, Partnership Strength Machine Design Automation. This comes to us from Daiqua Corporation. Daiqua is an innovative problem solver who provides custom gearbox solutions and puts together partnerships that benefits customers at every step of development. Today we have the president of Daiqua, Michael Quas. And before we introduce him, let me share a couple of important things with you. First, we plan a Q&A session at the end of this presentation, and you can submit your questions at any time by using the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll do our best to answer all questions, and if something comes up afterward, you are certainly welcome to contact Mike and Daiqua, and we'll be happy to help. We will provide that contact info later in the webinar. Second, a video recording of this talk will be available online in about 24 hours via our PTE website at powertransmission.com. We'll be sending out a link when it's ready and you're welcome to watch it anytime or share it with a friend. Now about our presenters. Our guest is Michael Quas, president of Co-owner of Daiqua Corporation. He's a degreed mechanical engineer from the University of Illinois. Mike is the second generation owner of Daiqua and has been serving as president since 1998. He's also active on a daily basis on the engineering and sales floor, and he's constantly working with customers, creating engineered solutions to a constant stream of power transmission applications. So Michael, if you're ready, let's get started. What's important for us to know about how you create custom partnerships that benefit the entire project? Gary, thank you. I appreciate that uh, that introduction. Yeah, partnerships in the world of automation are incredibly important. Um, and as I'm sure many of the listeners that uh, to this webinar realize that that particular market segment right now is absolutely on fire. Uh, we are just constantly being approached with uh, different types of projects that are in that world of automation. And that means, you know, companies that are trying to uh, improve process in something that they're producing or they're designing a machine to reduce labor content or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, there's just a whole, whole range of different things that are taking place in the world of automation. And, the, you know, as, as we kind of look back on what makes us successful in those projects, you know, one of the things that we have touched upon and realized is that, you know, we need to figure out there, there's, we need to figure out the attributes actually that make those partnerships successful. And we believe we, we know what they are. And what we wanna do today with this audience is kind of explore that a little bit. What, what are those attributes? What, what really does uh, make for good solutions uh, when you are trying to dive, dive into fairly complicated um, design problems and automation uh, uh, sequences and uh, process change and so forth, uh, specifically in the world of automation. The way that we want to try to approach uh, reviewing those kinds of things is really kind of take a look at a number of examples. Uh, I have four of them today um, that we want to talk about. And I'm, it's not just me that is going to kind of uh, express what these uh, projects were all about. I'm actually going to be bringing in a couple of good friends of mine and colleagues that I've had the uh, incredible good fortune to work with for a lot of years. Um, they're going to be, I'll be introducing them in just a moment. Um, but as we kind of talk about those examples at the end of each one of those, we're going to have um, some brief takeaways uh, that kind of highlight some of the main features of the main points uh, that kind of brought us to a real successful conclusion in those particular examples. And, and these, these are the kind of the main attributes that, that we need to focus on as we try to find uh, partners to create solutions. Um, at the end of the presentation, after we finish those four examples, I'm going to conclude by going through a series of slides that is going to explore a series of questions that a particular uh, customer or somebody that's looking to try to automate something, you know, what am I looking for in an, in an integrator? What, what kind of questions should I be asking to make sure that those partnerships that I create are going to give me, uh, get me to a very successful solution? So let's kind of jump in here a little bit. This is a slide, a couple of pictures of uh, some good friends of mine. Brian Cloding is is with us here today, as well as Pierre uh, DiGiorgio. Both of these uh, gentlemen are uh, the presidents of their respective companies. Um, they're also the owners of their respective companies. And I'm going to actually uh, hand over the presentation here for the next couple of slides to Brian. And, 
And uh, Brian, if you could uh, let our audience know a little bit about you and what BCS is all about. Thanks, Mike. Um, I thank you for all the attendees to the seminar to the webinar. We really appreciate it. Um, BCS was formed in 1986, and our our business model was a distributor integrator. Um, we realized very soon in our business that really we needed to become experts at the at the equipment that we were selling to our customers because a lot of our customers wanted us to add some value either that was programming most a lot of it was programming also building panels and um, also providing a complete solution and um, so our whole our whole company is organized around providing solutions that's why we call ourselves an autom automation solution provider it's not unique but it does it does give the customer an idea that we're just not in there to sell them a piece of hardware and walk away we are interested in in working with them and their engineering team and their sales team and their service team to to provide uh, a solution that is good for for us for them and and also for their customers so um that it that gives you an idea of who we are perfect um, you can see on the screen as far as some of our capabilities and uh, again thank you for for attending the webinar perfect thank you brian uh pierre i'm gonna let you go next uh pierre as i said is the president of blue bay automation pierre give us a little bit of rundown what you guys are all about yeah, Mike, thanks for having me as well. And, um, you know, I've had the pleasure of uh, working with, with Mike Lendaikwa for about uh, half of our existence here as Blue Bay. We, we've been in business about 20 years now, actually 20 years next month. And I've also uh, had, had the, uh, the, the honor of working with Brian for many years as well now. So uh, we've all become great friends. I have a great deal of respect for both these gentlemen. Um, yeah, so we've been around for quite a while. We, we started out to, uh, really focused uh, 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 on integration. <laughs> And, um, uh, but we've kind of morphed into a distributor over the years and um, uh, re realizing that the market was changing and that more and more um, of our customers were requiring uh, some value added services to the products that were being sold. And they also needed people that were able to not just sell a brown box, but also mount, make those, those products and those solutions work. So, you know, we built our company and we were uh, around uh, mostly engineers here. Uh, we're very focused on, on um, you know, helping our customers be an extension of their engineering and making sure that we can provide, um, you know, technical competency at the point of sale. So that's kind of Blue Bay in a nutshell. Fantastic. Thank you, Pierre. I appreciate it. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's jump into uh, kind of the examples and give everybody a sense of uh, some of the things that we've gone through. Uh, this first example um, was a company that is a, is a manufacturer. Um, who was looking to convert some of their equipment um, from something that basically is very fixed in terms of what it can produce and at the speed at which it can produce it uh, into equipment where they can put in different types of toolings and, and they can you know, uh, modify the types of products that they're producing on that tooling as well as uh, increase um, the flow rate and the production rates. Um, when we first started this, they had none of that capability. So they actually, um, and, and these are incidentally not small pieces of equipment. These are, it's, it's a, a kind of a, a punch press or a, a, um, a stamping uh, type application. Um, and they wanted to convert from uh, using AC motors and cam driven machines to ones that are highly flexible using servos, uh, high torque gearboxes and advanced controls. Um, what is very unique about this, however, is that it is, um, very difficult to take uh, loads that have uh, spike loads associated, which, which a stamping operation would, and drive those with, with servos, uh, because those spike loads are a very, very difficult thing to control. Um, they're also extremely difficult to calculate in terms of what the torques are, generally speaking, because of those spike loads. And most gearboxes do not like uh, having that kind of shock loading uh, being presented to them that they have to kind of drive through. So some really tough, uh, tough elements in terms of this particular application. The other thing is that, that these things have to run 24-7, 364 days a year, and there are multiple plants that have multiple machines in them. So super difficult application. And Brian, I'm going to let you give a little bit more history here. 
Sure. Um, we were approached by our an existing customer. We had done some work with them, um, doing some machine conversions, you know, upgrading drives and things like that for them. And the engineering group invited us in to take a look at this application. And um, it became very, very obvious to me right off the, right off the bat that that the gearbox and, and the whole application was going to be very, very difficult. And so we engaged both the, the, the people um, from DICA and also the people from Yaskawa. And we did a deep dive into what, what kind of power we're going to need, what the torque curves might look like, um, you know, how long would this, would this particular um, gearbox and motor last? Um, it's very unique in that we are driving a single shaft with um, two independent motors and doing an electronic line shaft. And those motors are going through, are driving a cam, which is driving a ram. And um, the reason why they did this is because they really want to modify that, that motion profile. And um, if it wasn't for, and, and so we, so we went through all that engineering, came up with the right motors. We, we built a prototype. And during that prototype phase, we had to make a lot of modifications to the gearbox to adjust for the shock and vibration, which we were seeing on the machine, which the customer didn't even know what, what those levels were. And um, so we had to encourage them to do some testing to get somebody in to test it. And um, so, but but we also had to harden the gearbox to accommodate that that particular shock and vibration. I'm, and when I mean harden it, they had to. We had to remove. They removed all the shims. They 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 really did a a significant um, design change to the internals of the gearbox. And and if it wasn't for that, the project would have failed because the gearboxes would not have last. And he, here's an example of what it, it, it looked like. It's a big gearbox. It's, uh, I don't know how many, it's a 15 kilowatt motor. And it's, and each one of these is, is mounted on, on opposite sides of the machine. And as you can see, there's, you can see there was some modifications just in the way that we covered the, the output shaft, um, the way that they, we we slotted so that and this customer actually the customer did some of this so that they could rotate it to get it into its initial position um a lot of detail i think i think you got the idea of what what we had to do here yeah also just to kind of recap yeah. yeah as far as some of the design modifications um you know the factory made the base unit um and 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 incidentally, this particular customer, they approached uh, they approached all the big box guys, right? They approached SCW, they approached NOR, they approached uh, a variety of different guys. They all turned it down uh, because th these are um, these are gearboxes that are not typically used in servo environment. These are gearboxes that you turn them on and they run in one direction and they just keep going. Uh, and we kind of applied a, a PT box to a very demanding servo application. And this was the result. So, and we can talk for a long time about the details and what we did, but the, just suffice it to say that it was a collaborative process um, where we went back and forth and and, uh, and and did a lot of things to make this thing work. Um, so, as far as a couple of quick takeaways on this, you know, part of the thing that made this thing so successful is is good cooperation between all the parties. Now, that may seem a little bit trivial. Uh, but in this case, it's not only the, the customer, but it's the machine builder that built the thing for the customer. It is Brian and his team, which are doing all the electronics um, and has to understand the motion profiles and, and do all of that kind of work. And then us on the side of the gearbox to make sure that uh, it can meet the incredible demands that were being placed upon it. Um, the other big takeaway is that we have the design and modification capability, which is not common. Uh, you go to uh, like an SCW and say, hey, I want to harden this thing for a servo application. They're going to say, well, what, which part number is that in the catalog? And I'll be happy to sell it to you. Th that's not our situation here. You know, we, we kind of take a look at what's standard and then what do we need to do to it to make it, it work for what a customer may need. And that brings you kind of to the third takeaway here is that is experts working with experts, right? So we had a very, very talented group of people, 
all the way around working together to share their know-how and integrate it with one another to make sure that we had a, a very viable solution in the end. So let's keep going here. Uh, example number two, um, this was actually a, a tower application. Um, and in this tower application, I'm gonna actually show it to you. Uh, this is a, a tower that a, a customer of ours had, uh, these guys are located out on the West Coast. Uh, they approached us and said, um, you know, we're having trouble trying to figure out how we can get these portable towers. These are towers that they pull behind with uh, with uh, pickup trucks and so forth, deploy them in the, in a in a um, environment. In this case, uh, upwards of 400 of these towers are in existence in a particular area. At the top of these towers, which are about, you're only seeing one section there, that tower is probably about 40 feet high. Uh, and on the top of that tower, you have a suite of ele electronics and so forth that are doing monitoring of some sort in that in that theater of operation. Uh, and they needed to be able to quickly lift and lower these towers and then move them to the next position. Um, and they approached us um, to kind of come up with a system by which they could do that. And this particular screw jack mechanism uh, is the result of that uh, uh, of that design effort. Um, and I'll, I'll speak to the mechanics in a bit here, but we actually approached um, Pierre and his team to help us out with the electronic side of this. And Pierre, you want to talk to that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. This was a, an interesting application. It was uh, it presented us with some challenges. There was, a, um, as Mike mentioned, it had to be mobile. So they wanted to keep things as, as lightweight as possible. Um, they also wanted to uh, run this off of a battery. And in particular, they wanted to use um, uh, power tool batteries. So we had to design, um, you know, custom uh, uh, battery receptacles, you know, 3D printed those uh, to be able to, to power this unit. We also had to consider the environment it was going into. You know, we were told that in many cases this could be in the desert, but it could also be in, in extreme low temperature environments and so on and so forth. So all of the uh, the, the enclosures we had to use, the, the cabling, um, even down to the motor that we selected, um, um, we had to take into consideration, like what you don't see, there's a housing that goes around that motor as well. So there was a lot of uh, uh, just environmental considerations that had to be given. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, sizing was was challenging as, on this as well, because as the um, as as the uh, uh, tower raises, it goes, there's different loads depending on where it at, where it's in, where it is in the stroke. So um, in addition to that, we also had to get some data from the customer um, to include the certain loads that might happen in high winds. So they they had to give us all of that information that might you know back feed down to the motor as we're driving it that we had to consider. So all of those had to be factored in. Um, they also were looking for a for a you know a low cost solution here. Uh, many customers are, but because of the volume and because of the um, um, the environment it was going to, they wanted to keep it low cost and new things may wear out. And they also had to make it where it was uh, uh, serviceable, so easily easy to change out a motor or, or any part of the electronics um, quickly and 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 effectively. Um, because also these these guys are, are were having to carry these up up you know in backpacks uh, up hills and up mountains and things like that to to deploy them. Um, in terms of the the you know the the application for us was quite a simple application in terms of the motion control. Really, you know we're moving to position um, and we're and we're staying there for a period of time and then and then coming down when they when they request it. But some of the challenges here were um, you know what if they had a problem with their mechanical uh, tower. Um, what if what if something were to, to the motor were to break down? They needed a way to you know to override the control system and bring it down uh, uh, mechanically. So Dyqua actually had to customize this gearbox to provide a as you can see there highlighted uh, an additional output shaft where they could connect just a power drill to and then and then spin it that way. Albeit it would take a lot longer to get to, to raise or lower the tower, they would still be able to do it. Um, so and then you know we. Part of the uh, the design of the the actuator, Mike. If you flip back to the, the picture of the actuator there, you can see there was integrated uh, limit switches as well that are that are built into the unit. We had to obviously monitor our over our over travels because you could do some. There's quite a lot of torque produced or and force produced from this this actuator that we could actually do some serious damage to their tower alone um, if it were to bind. So even on the control side, we had to do things like torque monitoring. Uh, which again changed to the stroke to know if we were to uh, if we hit a hard stop or if the the unit were in a bind. Uh, and in addition to that, we utilized the electronic um, over travel switches to know that uh, we if we were have gone too far or whatever reason that we wouldn't damage the uh, the, the screw jack itself. 
Yeah, a couple of other things, Pierre, I don't know if you remember, but they also wanted to do some kind of specialized load sensing and so forth. And when we told, told them the cost of those sensors, uh, they realized, uh, well, that's maybe not something that we want to do. So we solved that problem with these uh, three limit switches that you kind of see in this uh, scenario here. So as we're lifting and get close to the top of the stroke, we'd be in a high speed lift. We would trip that kind of uh, second uh, limit switch. It would switch to low speed automatically and then creep up to the top. Um, and so th these kind of simple solutions, if you will, uh, are ways that we can overcame some of the more expensive uh, real design things that they had requested, but were outside of the budget, you know, as we as we got into this. Now, the other thing well, I didn't want to go ahead. Go I was going to say too. I mean, the, the original the original solution that they they came uh, you know with was a hydraulic solution, which presented you right. know many challenges, right? Yeah, the hydraulics was kind of poo pooed initially just because. There's a power unit that is involved for the uh, hydraulic pressure and so forth. And in this case, really all you needed was the battery pack, a control unit, and that was uh, detachable and much lighter to be portable. So this was a more elegant design for them. Um, I do want to point out also uh, that lower bracket the, on the right side of the screen here, uh, this is something that we used some FEA technology that we have in house, the finite element analysis. One of, as Pierre had mentioned, the lifting uh, forces change throughout the dynamics of that stroke from start to finish. And as we got uh, in certain parts of the lift where they were at the most extreme in terms of the uh, pressures, the actual pressures that were being emitted, um, the bracketry that was existing by the customer was not strong enough. Uh, so we created this bracket um, and ran it through our FEA program to make sure it was strong enough for the lifting forces that uh, were needed in this case. And this is ultimately what was adopted. So um, this is what the unit looks like. This is the prototype unit that was built for them. Uh, it's currently being uh, tested right now in the field and uh, so far everything looks uh, pretty promising and, and we're hoping that this thing will go into the production hopefully within the next few months or so. So as far as takeaways here, um, you know, it's, in our case, it's the, the ability to anticipate what is, is, is viable. Um, as Pierre had mentioned, you know, they were dead fast. They wanted to go down the, 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 the path of using hydraulics and so forth. And we actually showed them a better way. Um, we introduced the screw jack to them. We did a bunch of animations for them and we were able to kind of get them to think in a slightly different direction. Um, we used a number of different tools here uh, in terms of uh, FEA technology. You see a bunch of CAD renderings. Uh, these were some actual CAD renderings that we used uh, in working with this customer before we even got down to the point of fabricating anything. And we were able to fully model uh, what you know what a solution might look like for this particular uh, customer. And then clearly uh, the work that Pierre did uh, with this thing. Um, we were just talking before we came on live here about some of the other nuances to this program, uh, which from a mechanical standpoint, me, uh, I, I am to totally clueless. Uh, but these guys had some really interesting, elegant solutions because you know when you back drive that thing with a with a power drill. Um, the, the drive motor actually turns into a generator and there are a bunch of things you need to do electronically to prevent problems associated with that, which, which Pierre and, and Brian are very knowledgeable on and, and I am not. So I'm glad they were part of that team. Um, third example, uh, this is another one that we worked on with Brian. Um, this happens to be a um, animatronics uh, company that built a really quite a beautiful uh, display. This is a company that builds things for people like Universal Studios and Disney and things of that nature. This happened to be for um, the lobby of a, a Wynn Motel in Macau. Um, and um, uh, Brian, I'm going to let you talk about what the challenges were in this particular one. Okay, Mike. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, just, just to give you an idea, folks, of what this application, what this machine looks like. It closed it looks like a Fabergé egg and the pedals that you see there were are driven by um, small lead screw actuators a planetary gearbox and a small AC motor and it would and, and all it did was open and close the pedals and and then there was another drive system which was very simple just a, an electric actuator that that would lift the Phoenix, which is in the middle, and lift it up out of the out of the, the Fabergé egg, out of the egg, and its wings would expand. Very cool application. Really, really sharp. Man, it was great. 
dealing with animatronics people are very, very, it's very interesting. Um, however, they missed the spec. They missed the 50 dB spec. And when they did the, the noise analysis at the customer in the customer's lobby, they read the customer said, we're not gonna accept this machine because you didn't meet the spec. The majority of the noise was coming from the, uh, the, the small screw table the, and the reducer. And we were able to reduce the um, noise of the screw table by, by putting a, a different type of screw in there. And it was a, it, it was a low noise actuator. But, the, but a lot of the noise was coming from the gearbox. Um, since it was a planetary and it was a spur because it's very intermittent use so we put a spur in cost was everything um so it was making a lot of noise so i approached dyqua and and said okay what, what can we do to 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 reduce this noise and what they came back to me says oh we've done this before we can put noise suppression coating on the gearbox there you go you can see it there and it will it will reduce the DB by three to four three to four points, and in in all of that what we did we were successful in getting the the whole machine under the 50 DB spec. And if we hadn't, the customer would have eaten the machine to neighborhood of a half a million dollars. So they were very pleased, and um, it's just one of those things that I had never heard of coding the gearbox for noise suppression because we've never had that example most places that we do business are like you all are very noisy you know um so that type of noise would mean nothing but in this place it, in this case it it, it it meant a lot so they were like what was very helpful the, the i mean we had the coding done almost immediately um and they were able to do the retrofit very easily one day and uh, the customer accepted the machine. Yeah, that was a, that was a really interesting. A couple of other quick tidbits of information you had mentioned earlier, just from a cost perspective, you went with a spur geared planetary, like the one that's uh, look, you know, planetary is the one that's on the left. You know, one of the ways you you knock noise down is by changing a spur over to a helical. That'll take some noise out. And then secondarily, you know, coating the outside with this noise suppression coating was was something that we have experience with and have used in a couple of other applications. This kind of came out of a, a medical application. Um, there was um, uh, a customer of ours that um, is like a like an MRI table, if you will. Um, and you know they don't they want don't want a lot of noise when the table is moving when a patient is on it. So we had to come up with some creative ways. This came out of that, and we have been using this kind of technique on a whole variety of of applications where noise is um, is important. Uh, and incidentally, the one on the right is a worm. And of all the gearing technologies, another tidbit of information, the worm is the absolute quietest, just by nature of the fact that it is 100% sliding action between the gears all the time. So you don't have the noise associated with the gears coming in and out of contact uh, as you would in any of the other types of gearing technologies. So, um, yeah, so a couple of quick takeaways here is uh, really, you know, sometimes. Hey, Michael, yeah, go ahead. Michael, we, did, we did go to a um, helical gearbox also. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we didn't use a worm is be because it was a very, very small space. No, I get it. I mean, sometimes, and it's right angle, right? So sometimes you can't do a right yeah, angle. Yeah, it was right angle. Correct. Right. No, I totally understand. Okay. Um, so the takeaways here is really, you know, just a, a simple solution based on experience, meaning, you know, Brian came to us, he asked uh, kind of an off, what he thought was an off the wall question. And uh, we just happened to have, based on work that we've done, uh, a solution for that. Um, and the other thing is, is we have the capability of doing that in-house. You know, we have our own paint booth here as an example. So, you know, an integrator that has the ability to do machining, uh, and, and not, I'm not just talking about me, but anybody that you might want to work with, uh, that'd be one of the things that you may want to look for. Do they have the ability to do the kind of modifications that um, would solve problems? Um, that's always a, a good thing to, to try to find out. So that was a, that was a fun one. Uh, the last example is a project that uh, Pierre has the most knowledge on. All I will say is that um, when I saw videos of how this thing uh, actually functioned, I thought it was, was pretty darn cool. 
Uh, this is a, a piece of equipment. Uh, it's a CNC machine that uh, makes uh, tobacco pipes, uh, makes the pipe heads themselves. I, I have a, um, um, not a video, but I have a couple of still shots of what this thing looks like in just a few moments here. But Pierre, tell us what the challenges were with this project. Yeah, this was a fun one. Um, this was this was a, a great example of, of you know where we brought in also um, you know outside resources, Dyqua in this case, uh, just to brainstorm and 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 come up with a solution for the customer. Basically, what they were looking for was um, um, an automated system to put in, inside their CNC machine that that would uh, you know machine these these tobacco pipes. Um, the way they were doing it was quite manual. They would they would place the pipe in there, perform an operation. Operator would open the door, flip the pipe, do it again, and so on and so forth. Um, this was kind of unique because the way you have to make a pipe is you have to be able to to machine the the stem, machine the uh, the bowl, um, and then machine the profiles on both sides. So there's a couple acts you have to do some transfers, and you'll see that in the in the picture we'll show you. But this was this was tough. So in in machining the pipe, they they wanted to avoid any any uh, parting line that you might see um, if you had any mismatch um, as you rotated the pipe and machine the opposite side. And the, the way that happens typically is when there's some backlash in your tooling. So they were looking for a zero backlash solution, which we which we offered uh, through Dyqua. Um, however, the cost of the zero backlash solution was beyond their budget. So we had to get creative. Uh, and this is where we started to collaborate more with Dyqua. We came up with a really cool solution using uh, planetary gearboxes, uh, a pair of them. And um, what we did was we basically, to reduce the backlash uh, and almost really eliminate the backlashes, uh, as we rotated into position, we, ro we, we uh, rotated the opposite side, um, the opposite gearbox on the other side uh, in the opposite direction slightly till, till we sensed the torque and we to, to, to take out that backlash. So that solved that. Um, yeah, you can see where, where Mike's pointing there. There's um, there's one right angle gearbox there, and then the same one on the opposite side. Um, there had to be two because in the middle there you see a vice. So um, in order to to uh, clamp the part, the operator places it in there, and then the uh, the, the the servo motor on the on the far side has to remain still while the so, while the servo motor on 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 the closest side to you uh, spins the screw and, and clamps the vice. But that vice also has to flip the part. So um, because we got to use servos on this, we're able to do what's called electronic gearing. And um, when we move the, the servo motors both together, then, the, then that, that vice would flip and you're able to machine the other side. Um, so we're able to use these planetary gearboxes instead of a um, zero backlash uh, gearbox on both sides, which saved a lot of cost. We also have to use right angle gearboxes here because of the space uh, constraints we had inside the, uh, the CNC. Um, a really cool part of this machine also is on the, the opposite side, you see a different gearing technology there. You see a servo uh, worm gearbox. Um, now, the reason we use a servo worm was, was, was a couple of reasons. As Mike mentioned, one of the reasons is noise. We didn't care about that, you know, being in a, in a CNC machine. It's already loud. Uh, but what we did care about was shock load. So as the, uh, the, the tool comes down and in the operation where um, this, on this side, basically the bowl gets, uh, the, the part gets transferred over. Uh, and we we clamp it with this mandrel here, um, and uh, we needed a way to be able to have access to to uh, extend that to expand that mandrel. And um, by using a servo worm, we're, and and because the servo worm has a hollow shaft, we're able to run the tooling that pneumatic cylinder straight through the middle of the of the shaft and expand that mandrel, while still being able to flip the part in, in that additional axis. Um, the other reason we used a, uh, a worm gearbox here is worms are really um, are, are good at handling shock load. And some of the plunges that they do, there's some very aggressive moves that they make here, especially when they're out on the end of the pipe, there's a larger moment load there. And um, when they impacted that, we wanted to make sure that they weren't going to break the gearbox. So uh, that's also another reason that we used a, a servo worm. Um, um, I'll, I'll, then the, the, the final thing that was, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Pierre. The final thing we did there, you'll also see these pneumatic cylinders on the side, these small cylinders. Uh, what, the, what we did there is one, once we locked into position to machine, we actually extended these little cylinders uh, as uh, lock pins, essentially, uh, to, to lock the shaft in place. And what that did was take some of the load off of the bearings uh, of, the, of the system of the gearbox, um, you know, just to, just to make sure that we could extend the life of those. And because there, there is a, we found there is a, 
well, very, very high loads. And, 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 you know, in particular, machining this wood. This is briar wood that they use in pipes, and uh, it's extremely hard. Um, so when they would make these, these uh, impact moves as they would come down and contact the part, we were seeing a high shock load coming back. We could even see it in the servo motor. Uh, we could detect them in there. So we, we took you know, further steps to protect the system by adding these, uh, these, these shot pins there. I also want to give a, a shout out where one is due here. Uh, what I really found really interesting is, although Dyqua was involved in the gearbox selection and so forth, this whole fixture is 100% uh, Blue Bay design. Um, Pierre's dad is a, a mechanical engineer who actually created um, this fixture and created all the drawings for this fixture. And then these guys fabricated this on behalf of their customer. Which is uh, which is really unique, and uh, I got to give you guys a lot of credit. This thing is is fascinating and and, and really well thought through. Um, just a quick uh, let everybody know what the pipes look like. This is uh, actually you can kind of see up in the upper section. You know, start with a blank here. These are some of the original in the first steps uh, where they uh, have to bore out the uh, hole for the pipe tobacco. It's transferred over to that mandrel, and then all of the shaping. Uh, is done on that uh, second setup or that second element of the single setup in that fixture. So this this was a kind of a cool thing. So really well done, Pierre. Yeah, very very interesting project for sure. Um, obviously, Blue Bay. I mean, both uh, uh, Brian and uh, Blue Bay are full panel shops here, so they you know they can do the the entire thing here in terms of uh, not only uh, making the selections, but they can you know fabricate everything. I'm sure you guys built these panels. These are mounted right to the side of this guy's. Uh, CNC machine. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, Shown Electronics is is a is a good part of just showing you know the additional, as many of you guys probably already are aware of that that go goes into this. But one of the things that you know the purpose of this this webinar also is um, you know attention to detail uh, when you're looking for a partner. Even things like you know we pride ourselves in making sure the panels are very very neat and well laid out and and well documented. Um, and I think it's that's just one of the things that even in showing this is that we pride ourselves in that and making sure the customers look the customer our customers expect that what we deliver will work um, but for some of the people who may see it um, who may not uh, be technical or, or understand it when they just at least see it and things look nice and neat um, you know that it, it it you know it stills a little bit of uh, confidence in them that they that that you know we care about the work we put out and uh, and you know we took the extra steps there to make sure that it's that it's done well well said, absolutely well said, and spot on correct. Um, actually, the, the takeaways we, we already covered, uh, uh, Pierre did a wonderful job of, of doing a, a wonderful synopsis on what's important here, you know, in, in, in the sense of, you know, initially the brainstorming of the application to come up with some out of the box um, ways of solving some issues. Um, you know, the use of the right angle boxes and the use of, um, driving them opposite one another to take the backlash out. I mean, these are, you know, this, this is not how most people think when they're doing automation projects. Uh, so that was very cool. And I especially enjoyed uh, seeing how the design came through with that mandrel that goes through the hollow bore of the gearbox. That was a, a really good use of how that, uh, uh, making use of that hollow bore. So um, in, in essence, we just went through kind of four uh, examples of, of different projects um, that we have done, the three of us uh, have done over the years together. And, you know, we were, as we were kind of putting this webinar together, uh, you know, we're thinking to conclude this, we really need to kind of wrap a presentation like this with discussing the kinds of questions that a, that a customer needs to ask or that they need to be looking for as they're interviewing a prospective automations integrator. Um, and that's kind of, I think, how we want to end this, uh, this webinar today, is we're gonna go through a couple of slides here and talk about the types of questions that we should ask and, and the types of responses we ought to be looking for um, as those integrators are explaining what they can or cannot do. Uh, and obviously, Pierre and, and uh, Brian are gonna chime in here as we kind of go through these slides as well. Um, you know, one of the things that I put up here initially was the partnerships need to be based on trust and experience. Uh, trust is a kind of a tricky one, right? Because uh, as we talked before, trust is something that, in my opinion, is is earned. But how do you transmit trust uh, or how do you uh, project trust? And one of those ways, obviously, I think is uh, through um, references and projects that may have been done for other people that are in the same ballpark of the types of things that you as a customer are trying to achieve within your automations project. 
And experience, of course, is to get a sense of, of the know-how based on the work that's already been done that they can demonstrate uh, that, is, that is being performed. Brian, Peter, you got, or Brian and uh, Pierre, you guys, additional comments there? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll say, you know, th throughout um, even these projects that we've all talked about here, you know, you see that we reached out to, to DICWA to collaborate on it. Um, you know, utilize your resources, you know, is, is some of the best advice I could probably give. And, and by that, I mean, you know, you, you have your internal engineering resources, but reach out to the experts that you know in the, in the field, um, brainstorm with them. You know, uh, we love to get involved in projects before they actually get to the design phase while they're still in the concepting phase, because, you know, your, your people with some, some experiences in different industries also might be able to you know, to, to, to borrow from, from, you know, problems that have been solved before and help you out. You know, don't go it alone. Yeah, that kind of brings up the, the next one here, uh, uh, you know, kind of dovetails into that is make sure that you have very open and thorough communications. Meaning, you know, what Brian or what Pierre just mentioned is that brainstorming thing. Um, you know, I, I know I, I can speak for DICWA and I think I, I can speak for you, Pierre. Brian, uh, I, as I'm sure done this in many cases uh, often as well. You know, the first conversations with prospective people that are doing automation projects is uh, doesn't cost anything, right? I mean, we're just talking and, and we're kind of getting familiar with what somebody's trying to do. And we try to ask as many thoughtful and thought-provoking and technical questions that we can come up with to make sure that we on the integration side have the ability to solve that problem. We're also trying to put that customer at ease to make sure that, hey, yeah, we are thinking about these things or we are maybe asking questions that hey, that makes sense to ask about the environment that this thing is in, or it makes sense to know that this thing is gonna be in a wet environment or that it is in a food service type application because other parameters then immediately have to come into play and, uh, and we need to know that. So that open and thorough communications in the early stages of a project are really, really important. So you gotta make sure that the integrator is open to that uh, and, and, and is willing to go down that path with you. Um, engineering experience in terms of uh, both controls and, and mechanics. Uh, Pierre and I have talked about this a few times in the past. Um, and Pierre, you said it way more eloquently than I did in terms of the mechanics being an afterthought. So I'll let you chime in there. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 it. Unfortunately, uh, from the uh, the control side, uh, you know, most controls engineers are are designing the 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 panel, the elect the, the electrical uh, um, every electrical part of the of the machine. Um, they get to the motor, they understand that they need a, a, a speed of torque, a, you know, have to consider inertia mismatch and so on and so forth. But oftentimes the, the, um, the gearbox is an afterthought, thought, unfortunately. Um, so, um, you know, many times when, when by the time they either get to us or to DICWA, the um, a selection in the design is, might be limited to what, how, they've de how they've designed their machine. It may not even be the right technology. Uh, for what they're trying to do, um, so it's it's unfortunately it's an afterthought. It shouldn't be. It should be considered right in the beginning. Um, but you know, oftentimes they don't realize they need a ratio to the end, or depending on what you know, if they end up going with a ball screw, they might not need a ratio uh, because it's built into the screw. But then if they go with a with a, a belt drive, then they they most certainly uh, need a a uh, a gearbox. Otherwise, the motor is going to be huge. Um, so there's there's consideration that need to be made, but that's why I would just say, you know, uh, reach out, sh share your design, uh, talk through the design um, early on, and it can save you a lot of heartache. It has me. Yeah, I also, also um, when the, the the integrator should be asking, once once you approach somebody, the integrator, whoever that is, should be asking the questions and and helping you helping the customer through that process right and, and I always tell my sales guys I said if you're doing all the talking you, you're not getting the information that you need from the customer so we start out asking questions that's we before we even talk about product we start asking questions about the application what about this what about that what, all the different things and bringing our experience with us to so that we know the questions to ask. We can look at the look at what they're trying to do, and and maybe we've already seen, uh, we've already been down that road, and we've seen, you know, the the pitfalls in it. And and 
the risks that that are associated with that particular technology and we can we can walk uh, help walk the customer through that that conversation and that's really becomes our job to be the integrator distributor yeah that dovetails really into the the next point here and also you know make sure that you got the right tech for the application and that applies to both uh, electronics and mechanics right um in the in the standpoint of the mechanical side you know pierre had alluded to that a lot of the the folks in the electronics world and the automation controls world um their knowledge base in my experience has always been in the area of oh well, in the server world we always use a planetary and they don't know much beyond that and the reality is is there's so many other types of gearing technology that may be way more appropriate than a planetary and so that's that's why you'd want to bring you know somebody that's got some knowledge and experience in the mechanical side into the mix to kind of talk about those things and the why why would you use a worm as opposed to a planetary or why would you use a, a helical bevel in in terms of something else right so there's 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 you got to get into that dialogue and you got to make sure that the people that you're speaking with uh, are knowledgeable on on those sides i can't speak so much to the electronics i know that the one thing I do know is the the one constant in the world of electronics is that everything is changing all the time. Uh, everything is improving all the time. The motors are getting more powerful. They're getting less expensive. They're getting more capable. Um, and the same thing on the side of, of controls and sensors and so forth. And I'm sure that's a full-time job for the folks like uh, uh, Blue Bay and, and um, the type of work that BCS does. And if, if you look on both of their websites, you will also see a lot of uh, the, the, the latest types of uh, robots that are being used. Collaborative robots are a big deal now in the world of automation. Uh, so you gotta make sure you're dealing with companies that stay on top of the latest innovations and the newest things in the market. Um, so that's, that's really important. Um, I, I threw this slide up here uh, because um, I think it's also important that you are working with people that have good quality products. There is an awful lot of uh, inexpensive imports uh, coming into this country. And uh, in, in many cases, those, those imports are okay. But one of the common denominators that we've always seen uh, in our world is, is that the quality tends to be very, very inconsistent. And if you want consistent quality, you gotta stick with uh, good quality product. And that doesn't mean the less, least expensive thing on the market, right? I mean, if you've got a super simple application and, and the least expensive is good for you, knock your socks off. That's fine. But if you have an application that is a little bit of a challenge, then you want to make sure that you're working with good quality products, both on the electronics and the mechanics. And the second line here, really what I'm talking about is um, one of the challenges that we face is there's a, a number of um, um, distributors out there that may have very, very broad product offerings, right? You've got you know, over a hundred different uh, product categories out there. My only concern there is it's very difficult for um, an average individual that's in one of those stores to be an expert on all of those product lines. It's not possible. Very often those larger companies, however, will have teams or they'll be putting together um, individual design centers associated with automation or what have you. And they get a lot more focused in their knowledge base uh, over a core group of products. And that's probably the direction that I would, would uh, uh, point someone if they're looking to um, you know, work with somebody um, that has you know, extremely large product offering. But I, I would recommend trying to stay with uh, folks that have a, uh, you know, a sufficient product range uh, to cover all the main technologies, sufficient in the sense that they are uh, technically competent on all the things that they have in their, in their bag of tricks and in their toolbox. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, you're, you're, you may not get what you're looking for in terms of the best quality of uh, or the best fit of the technology to a particular uh, application. Uh, and then finally, uh, the ability to customize and to manufacture in-house. Um, I personally think that's a big deal. Uh, it saves a lot of time. Uh, and it also, uh, I mean, from a DICWA perspective, we have just a much more broad knowledge of what's possible based on the fact that we actually have to make those things happen. Uh, if we have to constantly go to the outside for some of those things, then we kind of miss out on the, on the what's possible. So it just gives us a much greater depth of knowledge uh, in terms of uh, what we can offer for a solution. Uh, because I would argue, and, and I, Brian, I would say Brian and Pierre probably would, would share this uh, thought with me that 
you know, but for me anyway, I would say about 80, no, not quite, but let's say between 70 and 75% of everything that leaves here has some form of modification to it because standard out of the box uh, for many of the things that we do is not sufficient, you know, be it as simple as a different lubricant because it has to go into a different environment or whatever the case may be. You, you got to have the ability to do that. And in, in the world of electronics, everything you do is customized, right? Yeah, and most certainly. And, and also, I mean, I think the, the thing is, is that, um, you know, we always were bringing you the difficult applications, <laughs> you know, but because we know you guys can do it. Most other, um, you know, gearing manufacturers out there do not offer customization uh, services. It's too risky or they or they, it's just not in their wheelhouse. Whereas um, we've solved many applications with some really unique uh, uh, um, solutions that Dyke has come up with. Um, I think, Mike, you affectionately uh, refer to them as the Frankenboxes. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we've done a number of solutions where you're actually combining different gearbox technologies to create a gearbox, you know, where you have a worm attached to a servo, a planetary that may be attached to something else, you know, and uh, we do that quite often. Those are actually kind of fun. Yeah, I would say, I would say to, 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 to kind of, uh, you know, tie that all together there, Mike, is that, you know, with some of the applications that we've worked on in the past, I've seen you guys even work on outside of uh, working with Blue Bay, is that, you know, you've, you've sort of uh, created solutions for the unsolvable, right? So if, if, it, were, if it weren't for coming up with this unique solution, the there's no the, the product the project may have either failed or the customer would have had to go a completely you know different direction in order to make make it work oh that's fair that's fair yeah we we have done also, that hey guys also um it is it is it, it is very impressive to bring a customer into Dyqua so they can see the amount of customization and work that is being done on the gearboxes that they're selling um you have repair and you can look at assembly and, it, and they can go through the whole process with you and you don't and it and it's it's complete it's not chopped up like um like a lot of places are so it we it was very helpful on especially on that large gearbox application um to have the comp our customer come into Dyqua and just look at their capabilities well, well, that was completely unsolicited, but very much appreciated, Brian. No, well, buddy, um, it, it is true. <laughs> <laughs> well, very well. Well, anyway, I, you know, we, I think what we need to do right now is, is uh, kind of conclude the, the program. You know, I, I hope we were able to kind of communicate to our audience today the, the importance of collaboration and partnership, really. And, and more importantly, or equally importantly, I guess, is you know what are, what, are, what are the steps that you need to go through? What are the things you need to be thinking about? What are the things that you need to be asking to make sure you've got the right people um, that you're working with to solve some kind of automation project? You know, there are a lot of very, very good automation houses out there. I mean, obviously we've got great relationships with, with Brian and Pierre at Blue Bay and BCS, but you know, we also work with people like Olympus Controls and Purvis and uh, you know all, our audience is I'm sure very familiar with a bunch of different names of, of good houses out there both in the PT world that are going into automation as well as the motion control and uh, uh, servo guys in the world of automation and um, you know they're all very capable people but as you go down your projects make sure you're asking the right questions and uh, it's my hope that um, that you find good solutions for the projects uh, that you undertake so thank you very much uh, I think uh, at this point, uh, Gary, I think we're ready to do a, a Q&A session. Great. Thanks, Mike. And uh, great presentation. This has really been a fascinating look at uh, solving some big problems. I've got a question here uh, coming in, and I think we've covered this pretty well, but maybe we could start with Pierre and then Brian and then come back to you, Mike. Just generally, um, you know, maybe it's a question about personalities or expertise or whatever, but how does a customer know if they're really working with experts? Pierre? Yeah, you know, I, yeah, sure. I, I think, you know, um, Ask a lot of questions of the customer. Ask them to show their, you know, show their work if they if they can. Uh, un, un, understandably, there's there's times that we can't do that based on non-disclosures and things. But um, I, I think also just you know interview them, get a sense of of are they passionate about what they're doing? Are they uh, um, um, are they asking you a lot of questions about your application to try to get all the information? Um, you know, are they speaking with confidence and so on? I mean, I think there's a there's and I think you know. Uh, uh, um, 
checking your references, you know, getting going out there and seeing what they've, what, again, what they've done, if they'll show you anything, you know, going on a visit to a, to, to a dike or to a Blue Bear BCS and, and, and sitting down in person and, and talking through things. I think that the biggest thing is, um, is uh, the, the open line of communication. Great. Uh, Brian uh, is expert. Is that a, a line on your business card? <laughs> no. <laughs> what do you think? But how how do I def what I look for when I'm looking at 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 uh, doing things on the outside? I also look at the company culture. And do they do they get along? Are they um, do they seem engaged in what they're doing? Like like Pierre said. Um, some of the intangibles that that the that the culture brings is just you know a consistent a a, a ability to do the team the teamwork that's required to do these applications and not try to stomp on each other not try to just work together and you can I can feel the culture of a company when I walk in you know does it you know does it invite me and um, and I think that's important too because. I know that you know being called an expert is you know I'm I'm an expert in some things but I'm not in other things but um, within the team we are experts. That's right. Yep. Well put. And Mike, what's your uh, take on this? Oh, you know, I really I don't have a lot more to add to there. I, I think Brian hit it right on the right on the head. I mean. If, uh, if you're a prospective customer, get, getting in front of that integrator and, and not necessarily, you know, once you've whittled down to let's say the, the final three or four that you may want to work with, you know, having that face-to-face -face meeting is, is critically important. I, I think both Pierre and, and, um, and Brian are dead on correct there. Uh, and I say the same thing to my sales guys, you know, during this whole pandemic thing, when we were doing everything over the phone and Zoom meetings, man, that was, that's torturous. Um, and, and the real magic happens when you get in front of people and you see them face to face, you get a sense of who these people are, what they're capable of. And you also get a sense of, to Brian's point, what the team is all about. You know, what's the depth of that particular organization that you may want to be working with? And you will not get that from a phone call and you will not get that from a Zoom meeting. Uh, you really do need to make the effort to get uh, face to face with, uh, with the people you want to work with. So I, I think you know one of the big takeaways is, is get in front of them to, to meet them uh, and, and see what they're all about. I think that's a huge part of it. Excellent. Uh, I've got another question that just came in. And by the way, uh, folks that are attending, uh, please feel free to submit your questions using the GoToWebinar control panel if you've got something you'd like to ask from one of our guys. Um, okay, this next one asks about the evolution of events leading up to quoting and costs for automating something. How, what does that look like? Mike? Yeah, that's, uh, Brian, you want me to take that one? You want to take one? That's Hold a tough on a one. Can you, Gary, can you say that again? What's the evolution of events leading up to quoting and costs for automating something? I mean, I mean, for, for us, the, the, the first thing is the, is the, the consultative part and, and, you know, the, uh, uh, the investigative side where we have to get all the information we can. Sometimes it's frustrating even to customers when we're asking a lot of questions going back and forth when all they want is a price. Um, but we can't give a price unless we have the right information. You know, depending on the, I mean, depending on the application, it could be as simple as just a part number and a price. But for what I know, you know, Brian and, and Bluebell are very similar how we're set up. And, and we often get some of the difficult applications. And, there, and there's a whole, uh, you know, once we get the information, there's a whole, often a whole sizing uh, exercise that has to be done. Um, and that, and that, to be able to do that, we need all the information. Um, we can't just make assumptions because it'll it'll often come back and bite you. Um, and then we have to even if it's a gearbox involved, we have to, you know, select the right technology for that. So it can take a little bit of time. Um, there's a um, you can always throw budgetary out, but we don't even like to do that because it it, it it'll make you look bad, you know. Um, um, but it's usually it can be as simple as you know here's a quick answer and a, and a price. But again, if it's a system we're talking about. There's a, there's a uh, there's a timeline that that unfortunately can't be avoided. It's it's dangerous to it is dangerous to um, to give a ballpark or give an estimate. It's just in our world it's very dangerous because you really don't have enough information to to accurately quote something. 
um, unless you've done it before and you know or something similar then you can then and we do that if we do something similar we grab that that old job this is not this is not you know rocket science and we use those numbers and we compare and see what what can we use from that project for this project to get the customer uh, the numbers that he needs to get to get um, the projects funded and usually that's just a that's more of a funding question you know the engineers they want to know how much so that they can go back to their management and request the money but also think that this it was, it's also a an indicator that who you're talking to going back to what we said uh, before is if they're asking a lot of questions and trying to dive in and, and um, spend the time to engineer that solution for you um, that should instill some confidence in whoever you're working with that they're that they're crossing their t's and dotting their eyes for you Exactly. So that they can let you know if there's a budget constraint on the project or something like that in advance as part of the exploration of the of the scope, right? Yes, which seems to be always uh, the case, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it's gentlemen, the case. gentlemen, hey, thanks very much. Uh, Mike, could uh, we take another look at that contact information? Absolutely. All right. So we've got Michael Quas there. Uh, uh, you can reach the offices of DICWA calling in and they'll be happy to help you there anytime. Uh, Brian at bcsmotion.com, great website and a lot of good information to get a hold of these guys. And again, thanks to you, Pierre at Blue Bay Automation. If you're looking for uh, fascinating robotics type work, uh, Pierre, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Brian. It's great to have you all. And uh, we know how much you all emphasize how closely you like to work with people and companies who are customers. So keep that up, okay? Yeah. Let's give well, our we, presenters we a nice, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll give you a nice round of virtual applause at High Five Guys. Right. Uh, nice presentation, putting it all together and for sharing your knowledge on our program today. And uh, on behalf of all of us at Power Transmission Engineering, thanks very much for joining us and we wish you all the best with your upcoming projects. So have a great day and thanks again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye.